Greetings dear aspirants welcome to today's current affairs session of civil speedia today we'll be discussing about national culture fund and about national anti profiteering authority under our prelims topic and about the citizenship amendment bill and the 124th constitutional amendment bill under our mains topic so let's move on to our first prelims topic of the day national culture fund so we have a setup called ministry of culture under the government of india which takes care towards the promotion and the conservation of art and culture but this particular national cultural fund is a very unique fund so we'll be seeing about this fund in the later slides so when you're studying about this fund try to know something about the fund and uh, about the council uh, which manages this fund and the objectives of national cultural fund so uh, this was in recent news in our uh, uh, public information bureau that about 68.86 crores of funds have been collected under the national uh, culture fund so something about the national culture fund so it was established as a funding mechanism a unique funding mechanism from the existing sources and the pattern of funding uh, for the arts and culture in india so it will enable the institutions and individuals to support the arts and culture directly as partners with government so government supporting the arts and culture is one thing but uh, the private support and the corporate supporting the government uh, towards promoting and uh, preserving the art and culture is an another thing so uh, the private institutions will uh, help the government towards preserving the art and culture so this particular national culture fund was created as a trust in the year 1996 under the charitable end government act of 1890 which means uh, whatever uh, amount that we pay to this particular trust will be free of taxes so there will be tax benefits so this you need to keep it in mind so there is a council established for this uh, managing this particular fund so it is being administered by this particular uh, council which will decide on the policies and there is an also an executive committee which will actualize this policies nothing but executing the policies so this council is chaired by the union minister of culture so this you need to know so there is a separate minister for uh, the ministry of tourism and there's a separate minister for uh, ministry of uh, culture so just have this in mind so uh, you need to know about this national cultural fund the objectives of this particular national cultural fund so there are uh, four main objectives first is to administer and apply the fund for conserving maintaining promoting protecting and preserving and also the upgradation of whatever monuments uh, and that have been protect protected under law and second thing is uh, the human resource development nothing but the training and the development of the cadre of specialist and cultural administrator who are very much uh, specialized uh, towards maintaining the arts and culture and it this fund will also be utilized for innovations and experiments in arts and this fund will also be utilized for documentation of cultural expressions and forms that have lost their relevance in contemporary scenario uh, which means nothing but uh, which are likely facing extinction uh, at the present or which might face extinction in the future so the archaeological survey of india plus the private institutions have uh, clubbed up with the government uh, to uh, donate to this particular national uh, culture fund and many monuments have been preserved with the help of this national culture fund so if you go to this particular national culture fund website you would be able to see the number of monuments that have been preserved that is not required for prelims exam just know uh, what are the objectives of the fund and if it is a trust or whatever body it is and uh, regarding the tax benefits and who is the head of that particular council that administers this fund so this is all that you need to know about the national cultural fund so the next topic is the national anti profiteering authority national anti profiteering authority so the key words that you need to know under this topic is about the national anti profiteering authority and about the uh, directorate general for uh, anti profiteering and about the standing committee screening committee and the Uh, functions of this uh, particular national anti profiteering authority so this is all a part of national anti profiteering mechanism uh, so uh, the recent news was that uh, the uh, government has tabled the number of complaints that have received uh, by uh, the national anti profiteering authority in the lok sabha so uh, you need to know what is anti profiteering so when the gst was established uh this national anti profiteering authority came into being because there were complaints that whenever there was uh when whenever there were cuts in the gst rates the same cuts were not transformed uh, from the business providers or uh, the business people to the common public so the business people largely enjoyed the uh, uh, the benefits because of the uh, cut in the 
taxes. Hence, this National Anti-Profiteering Authority came into being. So, under this mechanism, there are uh, four things. First thing is the National Anti-Profiteering Authority. Second thing is the Directorate General of Anti-Profiteering. Third thing is the Standing Committee which will operate at the national level. And fourth one is the Steering Committee which will operate at the state level. So, whenever at state level uh, the screening committee receives complaints, it will scrutinize those complaints and send to the standing committee. And this standing committee, if, the, if this particular committee finds those uh, claims as a, a proper one, it will again forward to the Directorate General of Anti-Profiteering. So, under uh, the uh, authority of this particular uh, National Anti-Profiteering Authority, he has to take action within three months time frame to the maximum plus three months. Within three months, he has to take at extraordinary circumstances, he can go for plus three months and he has to give a solution for that uh, particular complaint. So, this is all about that particular anti-profiteering uh, mechanism. So, the National Anti-Profiteering uh, Authority will be managing all these DGAP standing committees, steering committees, etc. <clears throat> So, this National Anti-Profiteering Authority has been constituted under Section 171 of the Central Goods and Services uh, Tax Act of 2017. So, its main function is to ensure the reduction in the rate of tax or the benefit of input tax credit that is being passed on to the recipient by way of commensurate reduction in the prices. Because uh, whatever uh, cut in the tax rates can be only seen by uh, the reduction in the prices. So, it has to be passed on to the consumer accordingly. So, uh, this particular authority as a chair chairman whose uh, the post is equal to a secretary, a secretary post and plus four technical members uh, whose uh, position are equal to commissioners of uh, the income tax departments. And uh, what are the steps that have been taken by the National Anti-Profiteering Authority to ensure full benefits of tax cuts to the consumers? So, it holds regular meetings with the zonal screening committees at the state level and with the chief commissioners of central tax to stress upon the consumer awareness program. So, they, uh, they will uh, be conducting a large amount of uh, consumer awareness programs. For that, they will be conducting meetings. The authority will conduct the meetings. Second thing is launching a helpline to resolve the queries of citizens regarding the registration of complaints against profiteering. If you see in, in their particular website, uh, the frequently asked questions uh, topic, uh, we'll be having uh, this particular uh, uh, helpline for the consumers. Uh, 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 in additionally, we will be having one more helpline. And next thing is uh, receiving complaints through post, email and the NAA portal. So, uh, this particular complaint list was tabled by the government in the Lok Sabha. And if you see for the year 2018, the complaints were at large from the month July to October. So, at uh, numbers, if you see, it's uh, ranging from 67 to 90. And along with this one more function of the National Anti-Profiteering Authority is to work with the consumer welfare organizations in order to facilitate the outreach activities because um, the awareness at the business side can also be low because uh, the big corporates or the big businesses uh, will be uh, making use of these tax cuts and they will profit at last. But uh, by mistake, even small businesses uh, can uh, perform this sin. So, the government will uh, take outreach activities in order to give awareness to the business people as well. So, this is all about the National Anti-Profiteering Authority. But this we will move on to our uh, main topic. Uh, the first topic is the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 2016. So, uh, this particular bill was introduced in the month of July 2016 in order to amend the Citizenship Bill of 1955. So, the original bill is 1955. And now it, it has been passed in the Lok Sabha. So, it seeks to amend the Citizenship Act of 1955. Under this, uh, three amendments have been made. The first amendment uh, is all those uh, religions apart from Muslims. So, the religions such as Hindus, Sikhs, Parsis, Jains and Christians who migrate to India without the travel documents. So, technically they are illegal migrants from the uh, countries of Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan which happen to be the neighboring countries of India will not be regarded as illegal migrants. So, this was the first amendment that was made. And the second thing is the bill also amends the act to allow the cancellation of overseas citizens of, uh, of India registration if the person has violated any law in Indian territory. So, uh, if a particular OCI citizen per performs any crime, so his uh, card might uh, be rejected. And third thing is it has relaxed uh, some uh, uh, 
thing in the uh, acquisition of citizenship by naturalization for these categories of uh, persons. So, <clears throat> there is a naturalization process. Some norms have been uh, relaxed by the government. So, uh, one particular norm is, so when a particular uh, person uh, applies for citizenship, uh, the uh, the time uh, frame preceding 12 months of that application form, he has to reside in India. Plus, he also has to reside out of 11 out of the 14 years. So, this was the present norm. So, this amendment uh, has eased this norm to 6 years. So, uh, application date minus 12 months minus the 6 out of 14 years, this uh, particular uh, citizens uh, who are Hindu, Sikhs, Pasis, Jains or Christians can reside in India. So, this particular norm has been relaxed. So, these are uh, the three amendments made to the Citizenship Amendment Bill of 1955. So, there have been some criticisms against the government and the government has also claimed something. So, let us see that in detail. So, the first criticism is that it is perpetuating the religious discrimination. This was largely voiced by the Muslim outfits because it excludes uh, Muslims only and all the other region, uh, religions are benefited. And the uh, uh, some other persons have said that it has conflated the idea of nationality with religion, which means they have confused the idea of nationality with religion. And next thing is citizen cannot be granted on the basis of uh, religion because we claim that even in, uh, as per our constitution of India that India is a secular country but uh, this particular amendments that have been made to the citizenship bill seems to be non-secular to some uh, section of people and uh, <clears throat> the main issue is that uh, this bill will be a divisible bill which will burn the state of Assam is what uh, those uh, outfits from Assam claim. So, this bill is against the Assam Accord of 1985 because as per that uh, Assam Accord of 1985 people uh, those who have been in India after this cutoff date of March 24th of 1971 must be deported as per the Assam Accord. But now this will contradict this particular amendment uh, to the citizenship will uh, bill will contradict this Assam Accord. And next thing is it will uh, disturb the demographics uh, of the Assam society and will also affect the rights of the indigenous communities, those indigenous communities that are living in different districts of Assam. And uh, it also goes against the ongoing process of updating the National Register of Citizens, primarily based on the 1951 Otis list. So, it will contradict uh, la, uh, some of the sections of the Assam uh, record and also this National Register for Citizens, particularly in the state of Assam. But the government is telling that uh, this bill does not uh, targets the state of Assam, but it targets the entirety of India, especially the western states and the northwestern states of Jammu and Kashmir, Punjab, Rajasthan, where the illegal migrants have settled in those states who want for a proper uh, citizenship. So, <clears throat> India has been accommodating Muslim refugees from Bangladesh and Pakistan by giving long term visas. So, this is also happening at present. So, the government has claimed that it is also supporting the Muslim population. And if you also see uh, when uh, in the 1950s, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru, our ex Prime Minister, and also Suchita Kripal, he was the first Chief Minister, Women Chief Minister for India, I have told that it is the award policy of India from the beginning itself to give special consideration to minority refugees from the neighboring Muslim majority countries because the partition happened uh, because of religion only. Uh, India largely became a Hindu majority population and Pakistan become a Muslim majority population. And now uh, post the partition, the government wants to accommodate those minority communities living in our neighboring nations which have been partitioned uh, from India. <coughs> So, these are some of the claims that have been made by the government. So, this is all about the Citizenship Amendment Bill. With this, you can uh, give your critical analysis or you can even analyze the bill with the help of these points. And the next topic we'll be discussing is the 124th Constitutional Amendment Bill. So, you need to know what a Constitutional Amendment Bill is. So, if you are making amendment to any articles of the constitution, that can be done only by introducing a bill into the any either of the houses of the parliament. So, uh, introduction of bill is required in either house of the parliament. Then this particular bill once introduced after discussion uh, has to be passed by a majority of the total membership of that particular house. So, if for Lok Sabha, majority is more than the 50 percent. So, out of 545, more than 50 percent is a majority plus a majority of not less than two thirds of the members of the house present and voting. So, if uh, 545 members, roughly 50 percent 
plus some uh, person can be there so those members should be present and they should also vote only then a uh, bill introduced for amending the constitution is deemed to be passed in that particular house of the parliament so we need to know uh, what is this particular 124th uh, constitutional amendment bill is about so it aims to provide reservations in public employment and also in education for the economically weaker sections so we need to know who are the economically weaker sections that will be discussing in the later part of the slide so this particular bill aims to provide reservation in matters of employment and matters of education to the economically weaker sections so the economic reservation in jobs and in education is proposed to be provided by inserting the clause 6 in the articles 15 and 16 of the constitution so article 15 deals with the discrimination of uh, prohibition of discrimination prohibition of <coughs> discrimination And Article 16 deals with equality in matters of uh, all uh, education, employment, etc. So, the government uh, or uh, the uh, majority party, ruling party in uh, the Lok Sabha has uh, taken uh, these two articles as a reference for amending this particular constitutional amendment bill. So, uh, it has aimed to uh, give reservation in education and also in employment. So, let us uh, discuss that. So, in order to uh, give reservation in matters of education, uh, Article 15.6 uh, will enable the state to make special provisions for the advancement of economically weaker uh, section of citizens which includes reservations in educational institutions as well. So, this uh, is not limited only to the public educational institutions but also to the private educational institutions if they are aided or unaided except for the minority educational institutions that have been covered on the section 1 of the article 30. And it also states that the upper limit for reservation will be 10 percent. So, the reservations cannot exceed 10 percent. So, we will be seeing about the scenario of uh, reservations in the later slide. And with regards to employment, uh, the job reservations uh, proposed under the uh, clause 6 of the article 16 will enable the state to make provision for the reservation and appointments in addition to the existing reservations subject to a maximum of 10 percent. So, uh, the upper limit is 10 percent in uh, both matters of education and also in matters of employment. So, this you need to keep it in mind. So, now who are these economically uh, weaker sections and what is the present reservation criteria for in India that is present in India that you you need to know. So, let us see the present reservation status. So, the constitution of uh, India provides reservations to other socially backward sections, socially backward population that largely comprises of your scheduled castes, scheduled tribes and other backward castes. So, reservation is up to 15 percent uh, for the scheduled caste and 7.5 percent of the uh, for the scheduled tribes and around 27 percent for the other backward caste. So, this is the present reservation status. So, this will be uh, 49.5. And uh, in a judgment uh, which will be discussing in the later slide as uh, put a maximum limit for the reservations to 50 percent in the Indra Saini case. So, now uh, in addition to this the government intends to provide 10 percent reservation to all those economically backward sections in the general category. So, the remaining 51.5 will be the general category. In this 10 percent reservation will be given to this economically weaker sections. So, who are these economically weaker sections that we will get to know only when the government notifies as and when. So, it tells that uh, as notified by the state from time to time on the basis of family income and other indicators of economic disadvantage. So, they have clearly mentioned that this class will be distinct from already uh, present uh, the scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and the other economic uh, uh, other backward classes <coughs> and uh, if you see uh, one exception is the state of Tamil Nadu where the reservations have capped above the 50 percent cap. So, it is around 69 percent reservations. So, uh, this has been inserted in the schedule 9 of uh, the uh, constitution of India in order to immunize it from the judicial review. So, they, uh, a person cannot go for a judicial review in terms of reservations especially in the state of Tamil Nadu. So, uh, we might uh, uh, the center might face a legal scrutiny uh, because uh, by introducing uh, uh, reservation for these economically weaker sections. So, the government has claimed that the economic 
Slightly weaker sections of the citizens have largely remained excluded from higher education and public employment due to their financial capacity. That because of their economical positions, they are not able to access proper uh, education stream. They are not able to access proper employment stream. So they are left backward right from the uh, the the country got independence. Even now they are economically backward. So the government has found it a need. to amend the constitution in order to give them a fair chance of getting higher education and public employment so also as to fulfill the mandate of article 46 of the constitution of india article 46 is one of the directive principles of state policy which tells that the state should work towards uh, uplifting these uh, socially and economically backward sections especially the scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes so the government has taken this as an uh, reference and uh, gone for giving reservation 10% reservation to the economically backward sections but uh, we might not know what is the uh, legality of this particular amendment uh, so we might get to know once it comes to a judicial review if you see in the year 1992 indra saini case uh, she had put a cap of uh, 50% for the uh, reservation the upper limit as 50% <coughs> now the proposed amendment seek to get over this limit and also uh, in the particular indra saini case uh, the judges told that uh the social backwardness cannot be determined only with reference to economic criterion so if a person is poor uh, we cannot tell that that particular person is socially backward so economically uh, economic uh, reason can be one of the criteria so the money value can be one of the criteria but not the major criteria but if you see uh, what the government uh, intends to come up with this amendment is the economically weaker sections it is largely focusing on the economy and if you also in, uh, see uh, in 1950s uh, when the reservation first came up in the parliament uh, people uh, or uh, the uh, members of the parliament uh, emphasized that reservation is only for those people who are socially backward and educationally backward they did not highlight on economically backward it was in uh, present in only the directive principles of state policy so this is uh, one of the major move taken by the government in order to provide reservation to the economically backward sections and now if you see a uh, majority of the parties have voted uh, uh, in favor of this particular constitutional amendment but they did give their comment that this uh, particular government which has brought in the amendment is uh, doing it with a political motive because uh, lok sabha elections are near uh, hence uh, it wants to pick those upper caste votes so this was a recent thing and if you also uh, see in the year uh, 2016 august the gujarat high court had quashed an ordinance that has been brought by the government for providing 10% reservations to the uh, general category or the weaker sections in the uh, forward caste so this particular judgment is now pending in the supreme court so this is the status of uh, the reservation with regards to economically weaker sections so this again will uh, go uh, through a judicial review and it has just been passed in the lok sabha as of now it uh, will be uh, discussed in the large uh, last day of the winter session in the rajya sabha and we'll get to know if this particular bill has been passed in rajya sabha or not so this is all about the 124th constitutional amendment bill that you need to know from prelims point of view just know uh, the criteria that is required for a particular uh, bill uh, or a particular article that has to undergo amendment in the constitution so just remember this with prelims point of view and this 124th constitutional amendment bill deals with what so it deals with reservation to the economically backward sections so uh, this you can take and for mains you can quote this article 15 16 and your article uh, 46 of the constitution which is the directive principles of state policy and you can also critically analyze uh, with your uh, views to this particular uh, constitutional amendment bill with this we are winding up our today's topic please do like comment and share the video and please subscribe to shankar ias academy channel for latest videos and updates stay focused and motivated friends thank you